Okay, this chapter is on post-processing, and specifically we're going to be defining some terms related to reformatting and retrospective reconstruction, as well as talking about different forms of reformats like NPRs, um, as well as the, both the limitations and the benefits of these different kinds of ways of orienting the picture. So, broadly, post-processing uh, impacts two things. Um, and the big things are reconstruction and reformatting. Um, reconstruction is any time that raw data is used to create an image. Um, and a reformat is when an image is reassembled to produce images in a different plane or to produce like 3D images. Um, it's significant to note that these things are very, very different. So, for example, reconstruction is largely handled by the computer. And the reason it's called reconstruction is because the images, the data is first deconstructed into a matrix and then reconstructed into an image. Um, a reformat um, is done solely on image data and uh, it is just formatting the way that the data is displayed. So, retrospective reconstruction. Um, we can change a whole lot of things about how um, uh, image data is reconstructed, um, but we cannot change the orientation. So it needs to be exactly the same orientation. For example, if the images were acquired in axial, we will reconstruct into an axial view. Um, but the things that we can change are the display field of view. So say the scan was scanned at too small of a display, uh, display field of view, we can increase that. We can also change the ISO center or the image center. Um, we can change the reconstruction algorithm. So for example, we could add a filter to filter out metal, or um, we could use iterative uh, reconstruction techniques in this retrospective reconstruction part. Uh, we can change the slice incrementation only if we're using a helical or volumetric data set. Um, if it was acquired axially, we will not be able to change the slice increment or we will get like a stair step kind of artifact. Um, we can also change the image thickness if we're using a multi-detector CT system. So um, the significance here is that, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about overlapping and stuff in just a moment, but the significance here is that um, we want to use, um, very often we'll want to use a thin slice for scanning and then reconstruct thicker slices for viewing because then in storing those images, it's going to be more easy to manage those files, and we will maintain spatial resolution. So sometimes there is a need for an overlapping reconstruction, and for the activity for this class, we are going to look a little bit at whether or not we need to do an overlapping reconstruction. So let's spend a little time talking about this. Um, one thing to bear in mind is how pixels and voxels are understood by a CT scanner. So um, it mentions that overlapping reconstructions are not necessary if voxels are isotropic. What does that mean? Um, she gives an example in our textbook uh, of this, and it's on page 182 in um, Clinical Application Box 8-2. Box if I have two dimensions of data, like an X and a Y dimension of data, so this would be in my X dimension, and this would be my Y dimension, I'm going to call this a pixel, right? But if I include a third dimension in the form of a z-axis, right, so here I have a z-axis going off in this direction, this is now a voxel because it has a certain depth to it. So when we talk about bit depth and stuff like that, it's a little bit different because what we're talking about now is the distance um, that this pixel value is said to represent. And that, that distance is basically the, the, the thickness of the slice. So for example, if we have slices that were acquired at 2.5, right, that means that each, each element here, for example, is 2.5 um, millimeter thickness of data, right? Um, so I guess the question then is what happens if we have a, a tumor volume here? It will then be partial volume averaged, right? So we would, these two slices would have split that uh, measurement in half and we would not have an accurate display of that. So we, what we might mean, need to do 
is change um, and increase the number of reconstructions to include stuff in the gaps, right, so that we adequately display all that information. In general, uh, overlapping reconstructions are not necessary if the voxels are isotropic. That means if this was uh, 2.5 right here, but we also only moved it 2.5, so the pitch is of 1, then we don't need an overlapping reconstruction. But if we're increasing the pitch of the CT scanner beyond 1, um, we may need to produce overlapping reconstructions. Another case that she mentions is we may not need to do uh, overlapping reconstructions if the slice thickness is very thin. So 0 0.5 millimeters and less with a field of view that's very small, like uh, less than 25 centimeters, overlapping general uh, reconstructions generally are not worth the inconvenience associated with uh, storing this larger data set. There's not going to be anything really added to the information. So we can retrospectively reformat the image to change the, uh, the thickness of the slice, and that's precisely what we're doing when we when we do uh, overlapping reconstruction. On a multi-detector system, the data um, from parallel rows of detectors can be combined. So sometimes we use a thinner slice for scanning, but then we reconstruct at a thicker slice for viewing and storing. Um, this is going to maintain a high resolution for the image, and it also makes the workflow more manageable. I think I talked about it in some of the other classes, but basically, given the amount of CT scanning that we're doing in this day and age, um, radiologists are seeing quite a few of these images. In fact, one institution I looked at, the radiologists were required basically to read or interpret an image every three to four seconds. So anything we can do to help manage that data volume, they will appreciate. So that was uh, image reconstruction. Now um, we're going to talk about image reformatting, which is totally different. Um, sometimes, uh, some texts refer to it as image rendering, um, but when we reformat a CT study, first of all, all of these things must be absolutely identical. They must have the same display field of view, the same ISO center or image center, the same gant uh, gantry tilt, and there needs to be no gaps between the information. So sometimes if we're going to do real fancy reformats, we may need to do uh, overlapping reconstruction prior to the reformat. But again, I don't want students to get tripped up by this. So reconstruction, the reason we call it reconstruction is because the images, the data is first deconstructed into a, mat a matrix in order to construct the image. Image reformatting, we are just formatting the image for viewing. So uh, we are using image data. We're no longer using raw data. We're using image data for image reformatting. Um, we are going to generate images in a different plane or orientation. And we can better display relationships this way. We can do these three-dimensionally or two-dimensionally, or we can do um, two-dimensional images that actually account for um, the intensity of a sample. And in general, the thinner of the original slice, the better the reformatted image will appear. So uh, multiplanar reformat, or MPR, uh, is going to be a two-dimensional image, but it can be oriented in any of these different directions. So it might be in the coronal plane, oblique, sagittal, um, or even reconstructed in the axial plane. Um, one thing of, of note here, since MPRs are 2D in nature, they will retain the original CT attenuation value, so we will be able to measure a Hounsfield unit off of an MPR. That will not be the case when we talk about uh, three-dimensional imaging. So here are some examples of multiplanar reformats. Um, in particular, these look like they're imaging the aorta or maybe the, the heart. Um, in fact, this view up here is uh, coronal, sagittal, and this is an oblique view that allows us very nicely to see almost the entire aortic arch. A curved planar reformat um, are created along the center line of a tubular organ, and so the techs are manually putting in waypoints for the machine to create a curvilinear uh, image reformat plane. So here's an example of the entire carotid artery, more or less from the arch of the aorta up into the brain. Um, and this was done in a curved planar reformat, because if you can imagine, here's the arch of the aorta with the carotid artery branching off. 
and then it goes back midline. And so essentially what they've done is they've put waypoints along the length of the carotid artery um, to tell the machine exactly how it should be reformatting, and it created a plane of reformatting that's essentially like that. So as it, as it slices through the anatomy, we got a single slice with the entire uh, carotid artery on it. 3D reformats are going to represent an entire scan volume on a single image. And so uh, the techniques that we're going to use to manipulate the data is we're not going to be able to include the original Hounsfield unit values. Um, and basically it creates an imaginary line from the viewer through the data volume. And so it's going to generate manip the data along that line. It will shade the data in order to give it a 3D uh, so the first part, these are largely older in technology or technique, the uh, surface rendering. Um, I think a lot about older video games. If you've ever been playing a video game and you've seen um, maybe through the map or through the world to kind of a gray space or an area that um, looks strange, that kind of uncanny valley they call it in programming language, that's because it's surface rendered. So there's nothing beyond that surface. There's no actual volume to what you're seeing. Um, so she has an example in the textbook found on page uh, 86 of a surface rendered image of a foot. And you can actually see portions of the bone that appear um, almost kind of cardboard cut, off, cut out looking. So only the voxels on the surface of the structure are used. And this, is, this technique has largely been replaced by volume rendering. So here are... MIPS, and this is an interesting way of thinking about three-dimensional data. I know you, you may say this still looks two-dimensional to me, but what the computer has done is it's gone through and it's selected the voxels with the highest value to display throughout the 3D volume. So for example, we have these nice, beautiful, clear views of the aorta on these images, and here we have this oblique view up here where we see the entire aorta in a single view. And we're seeing it as a MIP, as a maximum intensity projection. And so all of the values that are higher are being displayed right now. Um, Min-IPS are minimum intensity projections, and largely these are only used when we're viewing the lungs or the trachea. And now we're, it's going to select the voxels with the lowest value to display. So in this case, we can clearly see the trachea and both lungs. Volume rendering. Um, this is like in... Um, in contrast to the surface rendering, in this case we're able to see the entire uh, volume of all the voxels that are included in the image. Um, and so this allows us to display multiple tissues and their relationship to each other. Also with a volume rendered 3D image, we can actually go slice by slice through the 3D volume and see uh, the relationships to things within themselves. Endoluminal reformats are a form of virtual reality and they uh, allow a perspective of a volume rendering or like virtual fly-through of any kind of luminal space. So this could be um, a bronchoscopy, a virtual bronchoscopy, or CT, virtual colonoscopy. Um, and it's designed to look just through the lumen of that structure so you can kind of fly through the colon or through the uh, bronchioles. So region of interest editing is done to remove or obscure structures from the 3D image. Um, so the software will allow this in either a manual, automatic, or semi-automatic fashion. So for example, looking at the discussion earlier where we talked about the carotid artery, um, if we're tracking the carotid artery up and it goes up, eventually it passes through the base of the skull in this area. Um, and if we want to look at this as a three-dimensional view, right, um, we might have to subtract out a portion of the skull. But the problem is, is if I highlight this area here with an ROI, it will start to populate out everything that has the same uh, attenuation value as the region that I've highlighted with the R ROI. So it will grow out this carotid artery up through the area of interest. But when it reaches the bone of the skull, it will start to grow out the skull. Similarly, if there's any kind of streak artifact, like say the patient has um, metal teeth, or uh, I shouldn't say metal teeth, but dentures or orthopedic, or any kind of uh, uh, streak artifact occurs, um, 
it could eventually start to grow out into the streak artifact as well. Anything that has the attenuation value that I first indicated with the ROI. So um, that is both a, an advantage there is that you can quickly grow out uh, an arterial study. Disadvantage is that um, it may include areas that were not of interest. So um, there's a number of things that can detract from a reformatted image. Um, segmental images are, uh, or segmental errors, I should say, are um, any time that there's a gap between data sets. So say we used uh, a reconstruction that had some gaps between the data, we will see segmental errors where we can see the gaps between the data set. Um, any kind of image noise uh, will impact uh, the quality of, of our image. And so if we look at page uh, 91 in our textbook, we can see um, a number of artifacts that are caused. One in particular, figure 812, um, has some motion that has uh, distorted the view of the aorta. Metal, as I indicated before, can cause a, a metal artifact or a streak on the image that might influence any kind of reformat. And then if, we, if, the, if the data set was initially acquired axially, we will not be able to do any kind of um, three-dimensional or oblique or perhaps even coronal um, reformats will get a stair-step artifact. We can see that on uh, figure 8 to 13 in our textbook. All right, that concludes uh, this lecture, this portion of the lecture. Thank you very much.